Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me clear. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, say good evening to everyone and thank you for taking some uh, of your personal uh, afternoon, evening time to join us in this Pulmonary Hypertension Awareness Day. Uh, Dr. Shaya and myself will be uh, with you tonight for a couple of hours. Hopefully we will stick to the time. Uh, and we will be just uh, taking a journey together about pulmonary hypertension in different formats and hopefully it will be easy and uh, clinically relevant. Uh, I'm sure you will associate with what we are uh, going to talk about and we'll be very happy uh, to get your questions, feedback and any, any issues that uh, you feel like it's necessary to, to uh, go ahead and then bring it uh, to the discussion. Uh, we would like to appreciate uh, the sponsor for the activity, uh, Bayer uh, Pharmaceuticals, uh, for their uh, diligent effort in advancing the care and support for pulmonary hypertension patients in the kingdom. And uh, uh, hopefully we will continue to have uh, these kinds of educational activities, which are, by the way, very pure educational rather than marketing. So we're not here to market anything, yet we are here to try to uh, uh, share the knowledge and experience uh, with you all at uh, uh, all levels. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started. Dr. Shay, I will be joining you after my first talk. Uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about the uh, introduction and uh, uh, to begin with definition and the classification of pulmonary hypertension. This is a schema of a pulmonary uh, vessel in normal uh, lung. Very thin layer, very smooth, very nice. It's very low resistance. It can accommodate good amount of uh, cardiac output. It's very distensible. So the resistance is, is low and the pressure inside the pulmonary circulation is low. And this is how it is uh, uh, structured. This is how we were uh, created. And the creation is, of course, is, is more than perfect. Uh, we cannot even just imagine how, how important this physiology is in order to be able to accommodate our uh, stressors, our exercise, and our ability to accommodate and cooperate with our uh, physiological changes. These are just the run of the numbers of the pressures within the pulmonary circulation. Unlike our systemic circulation, our normal blood pressure is 120 over 70 or so, but in the pulmonary circulation, the uh, mean pulmonary artery pressure is usually below 19. In average, it is 15, and the resistance is very low, uh, like uh, 70 dynes, less than one Woods unit, and this is just this is, this is the norm. Uh, when we start having the problems with these pressures, with these resistances, we will start having an elevation in the pulmonary pressure. That means that we have pulmonary hypertension. So as simple as is, pulmonary hypertension is elevation of the pulmonary pressure above 20 millimeter mercury. We said the norm is below 19. Uh, once you hit the 20, this is abnormal. This is somewhat a new definition. It used to be 25, if some of you were aware of the numbers before, but recently it was uh, uh, recommended and was uh, supported that we're really pushing too too much when we wait until the 25 millimeter mercury. Um, it's, it's a different disease. It's not one disease. Pulmonary hypertension is not one disease. I'm sure we have different backgrounds with the audiences and you probably will be seeing some pulmonary hypertension form in a way or another. And uh, uh, we, we will try to explain this uh, to you to make it easy. Not every, not, not every pulmonary hypertension is, is pulmonary arterial hypertension. There is a little bit distinction in the definition and that's what we will be talking about. The disease is relatively new, and this is one of the areas that I always get fascinated when we talk about pulmonary hypertension. Uh, we all deal with uh, like ever-standing diseases. Tuberculosis was discovered in the Egyptians. Uh, Brucella, we have uh, uh, famous people who died with the Brucella that we know about them in the history long history of diseases, but this disease is relatively new, the description of which was about 100 years ago, and it was in a simple uh, case report format that came from uh, Austria or Germany, if you wish, at that time, uh, uh, in that area, 1891 first case report. And after that, there were some, you know, more case reports by 19. 54, there were about 39 cases from the US that were put together and they had a review article about it. So we are talking about a relatively new science, a new disease by all means. At that time, uh, medicine has advanced tremendously in the past 100 years uh, than ever before. And probably in the past 20 years, it is even having a, a, another further leap uh, in terms of diagnosis in terms of uh, therapeutics. And I think we are on the verge of having, after the genomic project, on the verge of having another way to look at medicine in general in our diagnostic and therapeutic approaches. 
Uh, the disease has uh, went through phases of some case reports. People did not know much about it. If we have somewhat uh, my age in the audience, uh, medical school, this is a bad disease to have. We don't have any treatment for it. But in the recent past, in the last 20 years or so, interest has become, uh, you know, very tremendous. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are making new medications and we have more than 13 different agents to treat pulmonary hypertension, which is considered the great and within short period of time. But the disease took about 70, 80 years without have, have not having much of attention to the point where some people, they just don't know much about it. We just hear about it. it's a bad disease uh, uh, to have. The first therapy became available to treat the disease only in 1996, and the, the form of the therapy was somewhat difficult to handle. It is a continuous intravenous prostacyclin uh, therapy, after which the interest really picked up. Uh, the World Health Organization did recognize uh, this as being some potential uh, disease that uh, it needs and to be addressed. In the 1970s, they held a meeting there was no information available at that time, but now they held another meeting and they called it the World Symposium for Pulmonary Hypertension. And they decided to meet every five years and discuss what is being uh, released. And uh, you know there have been six of these. Every few years they meet, they review the literature. And in the first meeting, there were a few number of people attending it. The last meeting, there were about 1300 people attending the meeting, which is considered significant improvement. Uh, and the interest in the disease. Now we have a disease that you very well identified, a therapy that can be offered to the patients. So mine as well, let's get involved, let's talk about it, let's research it and to try to help the people who suffer from pulmonary hypertension. The classification initially came as five groups, probably you are somehow familiar with them in simple format. This is the primary pulmonary hypertension, that's the old name of the disease. There is the secondary forms and everything else was secondary. They called it pulmonary venous hypertension or pulmonary hypertension secondary to left heart disease. There are pulmonary hypertension associated with lung diseases, hypoxia, uh, severe sleep apnea, and the you know any any form of congenital abnormality in the lung that can lead to elevation in the pulmonary pressure. And of course, there is the pulmonary hypertension that occurs due to recurrent thromboembolism called CTEF, uh, uh, where there will be obstruction in the blood vessels and elevation in the resistance. And finally, there is a group of the diseases that is not very well characterized. It's the others, if you wish. And a lot of these are related to some uh, uh, metabolic errors of metabolism diseases like uh, Gaucher syndrome and, uh, uh, and the type of diseases. And the others are hematological malignancies or hematological abnormalities that lead to uh, turnover of the blood vessels. Uh, sickle cell disease is one of these uh, uh, groups of diseases. Again, this is meetings every five years. They kept meeting until the last meeting took place. Uh, this is the meeting before the last, and this is the final version of the classification that I mentioned to you. Our interest tonight is in the group one, pulmonary arterial hypertension. It's just start naming it pulmonary arterial hypertension instead of primary pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary venous associated with uh, respiratory system, chronic thromboembolic disease, and others. Now, the yellow here, these are the different diseases that can lead to pulmonary arterial hypertension, as I will define it for you in a few minutes. But you would notice that there is an idiopathic form, there is a familial form that runs in the families, and there is an associated form that can occur in different subspecialties, from congenital heart disease, from collagen vascular disease, from liver diseases that lead to portal hypertension. HIV is known to cause pulmonary hypertension as well. And there's another group of diseases, it's called pulmonary veno-occlusive disease that have some subcategories behind it that can look uh, similar to the pulmonary hypertension in its presentation, sometimes hemodynamics and, uh, uh, you know, probably PVOD is different in the treatment, but again, they share a lot of common features. So as you can see, pulmonary hypertension is not a disease. It's a constellation of the disease, the multiple diseases affecting various parts of the body that will be, uh, you know, there's a common final pathway in these diseases, which is elevation in the pulmonary artery pressure with the preservation of the left-sided pressures, meaning there's no left heart disease and there is no other clear explanation of the elevation in the pressure in terms of lung diseases. And all of these, they share very similar definition of the disease, but they do have similar clinical presentation. They have similar pathological findings. When you look into the tissues in the, under the microscope, they have characteristically uh, similar hemodynamics as measured by the right heart cat. And currently we are approaching all these diseases in terms of treatment strategies the same way. You don't find uh, yet disease, uh, like studies looking at therapy in sub 
groups of patients who you know have a specific disease they are always included in the same uh, type of uh, you know research or uh, studies that includes pulmonary arterial hypertension with different percentages of contribution in the diseases this is the last uh, symposium that took place in 2018 and i tell you significant good number of uh, people from saudi arabia uh, and the middle east in general we had friends from uh, the gulf friends from egypt uh, friends from lebanon who joined uh, the meeting so it was very nice that we have the interest has been picking up in this disease and now we have some specialized centers in the region uh, that can address the disease and offer uh, uh, you know subspecialty treatment for them consultation for other hospitals and of course uh, uh, provision of the highest standard of care in terms of diagnosis and treatment uh, we talked about the definition and uh, now the number 25 has been replaced by 20 after 2018 uh, uh, meeting it is not reflected yet in the new guidelines but the guidelines are not published yet because of the corona hopefully they will be published either end of this year or early next year but the definition is elevation in the pulmonary pressure above 25 with normal left ventricular pressures, meaning normal wedge pressure, and increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance, where it indicates the presence of vasculopathy rather than flow or volume that is leading to the increase in the pressure. This is the most current uh, acceptable format. The pressure can be looking into pre-capillary, uh, post-capillary, uh, and again, now we are always looking at the pre-capillary. Pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension can be caused by the PAH, it can be caused by lung diseases, and of course, it can be caused by chronic thromboembolic disease. Anytime we start seeing elevation in the pressure in the left side circulation, meaning the wedge is high, that is probably not uh, uh, what we are talking about. And by definition, this is the most common cause of pulmonary hypertension, uh, not the pulmonary arterial hypertension. Whenever you see elevation in the pulmonary pressure, start thinking of the left heart as a common cause for this elevation. Uh, lung diseases are common if the patient is suspected to be having uh, interstitial lung disease or COPD or severe asthma, severe obesity and uh, hypercapnia and obstructive sleep apnea. That might be probably more likelihood to cause the pulmonary hypertension rather than the pulmonary arterial hypertension that we talk about. It still is a rare disease, uh, considered one of the rare diseases. It affects, uh, over the years, you accumulate hundreds of these patients, but still it's considered a rare uh, uh, disease. So it's a group of patients who have uh, characteristically similar hemodynamics as we defined it, elevation in the PA pressure, normal wedge pressure, and the uh, elevation in the pulmonary vascular resistance. Again, they called it pre-capillary. And when it's post-capillary, there is a little bit more differentiation. Is it the pure post-capillary, meaning it's just elevation in the left side of the pressures, pure heart failure, or sometimes with the chronicity, this chronic heart failure can lead to remodeling of the pulmonary vessels, and it can lead to elevation in the pulmonary vascular resistance outside the just elevation from the pressure itself. And these are a special characteristic, characterized group of interest for research. We see them a lot in our clinical practice, but they are still not the patients that we are talking about, especially when it comes down to treatment. These are still a group of patients whom the treatment for which is unknown. We have to treat the underlying disease, similar to the lung disease, similar to the heart disease. But again, they are a special group of patients that we are looking how can we help them uh, further. I showed you earlier a picture of the pulmonary uh, artery. This is a patient who died with pulmonary hypertension. If you see, there is uh, plenty of cells inside the blood vessel and almost occlusion of that blood vessel, meaning that the blood is uh, having a very high resistance and that can clearly explain why the patients start having symptoms and leading to the disease as we know it. This is another uh, pathology of a patient who's just barely having very slit uh, uh, in the pulmonary uh, uh, you know, vessel and all these cellular infiltrates into the uh, in, you know, intima and interstitium of the blood vessel that leads to the narrowing and obliteration of the uh, uh, thing. Pulmonary hypertension is not a vasoconstriction disease. Vasoconstriction is part of it, but as, as you saw, there will be remodeling, there will be structural changes that will affect the development of the disease. So there will be cellular infiltrates, there will be inflammation, there will be fibrosis, and uh, there will be a com you know, component of thrombosis as well. And of course, the vasoconstriction is, is part of it, but it is not 
like the systemic hypertension where the tone of the blood vessel is increasing and that's what's leading to the elevation in the pressure. This is a little bit different uh, pathophysiological or pathobiological uh, uh, mechanisms that leads to the pulmonary hypertension. With this increase in the resistance, of course, the heart has to work harder in order to push the blood into the pulmonary circulation. It can accommodate, we are created perfectly, you know, the body can accommodate certain uh, stretches. We have a good reserve in general, but this reserve has its limits. And by the time we exhaust all our limits, the cardiac output will start declining, maybe pre-symptomatic. Nobody knows that what's going on at the cellular level. Maybe symptoms start in a mild form and some people might ignore the symptoms. Some doctors might not pick up on the symptoms because it is not a common disease. I mean, probably asthma as a cause of shortness of breath is much more common than pulmonary hypertension. Patients not feeling great or exercised uh, capacity affection might be because of deconditioning, be more commonly or because of obesity, but again, the symptoms might be early uh, and mild, then as a progression, it will lead to, you know, sudden decline in the cardiac output and it might present with right heart failure. This is something that uh, uh, we see commonly and it's unfortunate, we're trying to change that, but every now and then we will see some young person coming to the uh, emergency room with a florid right heart failure from pulmonary hypertension that has been missed. And we know this disease has been going on for some time. Either the patient ignored their symptoms or the, the physicians did not pay enough attention to refer the patient properly. We talked about how do they come uh, present. They present with dyspnea, which is a common symptom that is not specific. None of these symptoms are specific. Depending on the degree of heart failure that they have, they can present sometimes with shock and sometimes they can present with uh, a progressive exercise incapacity where a few meters will make a difference uh, in their symptoms. They cannot walk to the bathroom, they cannot come to work, and of course, all the way up to syncope where their cardiac output might drop suddenly leading to uh, uh, syncope. And we follow the classification of the heart failure in terms of the uh, modified the New York heart uh, classification for symptomatology. They might present with functional class one, meaning very limited symptoms, all the way to functional class or uh, uh, New York heart class four, where they are symptomatic even at rest and they do require uh, either being bed bound or uh, wheelchair dependent in their existence. Uh, the group that we are interested in, this is just repetition, and this is the latest uh, classification for it. Not much change. Still, we maintain idiopathic, meaning we do not understand why it's happening. There is not a, 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 an enough explanation from other diseases that can lead to it. Heritable, when there is more than one family member that is affected. Drugs and toxins, we don't see that much here, but in the West, some other countries, they do have uh, amphetamines, cocaine, all of these drugs can lead to pulmonary hypertension. Luckily, we don't have uh, much of that, but they can lead to pulmonary hypertension and the pulmonary hypertension associated with, which I want you to pay any good attention to it because we all see connective tissue disease patients, whether uh, a rheumatologist, internist, primary care physician. Uh, luckily, again, HIV is not a common disease. Liver disease, we were talking recently about how much of uh, the liver the patients get misdiagnosed when it comes down to pulmonary hypertension. They are rarely being picked up, and unfortunately, they come to you know to, to our attention very indirectly rather than looking for the pulmonary hypertension as a disease with them. You know, liver disease is very complicated. Patients are sick, they are edematous, they might have a lot of reasons to have the symptoms, but knowing that up to now, 8-10% of the patients might develop pulmonary hypertension should make us at least aware and you know, some of these symptoms might be related to the development of uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension. Why does it happen? People ask, and we get asked this uh, uh, question a lot, why me? Why did I get pulmonary hypertension unlike my siblings or my friends? Uh, we know this disease affects women more than men, and we know in our part of the world it affects younger people than older people. Uh, you know, patients, females in their 20s and 30s, commonly, sometimes 40s, uh, they come, they are at their prime life, and they are having this disease that can be very, you know, incapacitating. But why does it happen? Now, there's a lot of theories. Uh, I'll just run them quickly through you. Uh, the genetic basis of the disease has been somewhat unraveled in the past uh, 20 years or so, and we know that there are some genetic predisposition for the patients. BMDR2 is one of the genes that is, uh, uh, you know, early on identified as a cause of the pulmonary hypertension. This 
this uh, uh, molecule, this protein is good for uh, rejuvenation of dead cells. So it is healthy, it's needed in order to uh, be able to maintain apoptosis under check and the uh, health of the cells in general. When there is a defect there, we lose control over uh, the programmed cell death. And uh, when you lose control, there will be more proliferation. And we know that there is multiple genetic defects in the pathway for this PMBR2 in the receptor and in the in, in intracellular signaling through SMADs all the way to the nuclear changes that control the cell death. But when you lose this, the cell death is not programmed and not controlled, and it can lead to proliferation and uh, development and loss of regulation and the growth of differentiation, and that will eventually lead to the pulmonary hypertension. Uh, this was, you know, uh, stimulated the thinking of some people is that it looks like a cancer when the endothelial cell itself with, uh, there's a, a head to it, there is inflammation, there is something that's affecting it, whether it's a rheumatological disease, whether it's a virus, uh, that will eventually lead to uh, transforming this endothelial cell into a malignant cell. Similar concept, some of the progenitor cells might migrate from the bone marrow and replace these uh, endothelial cells. And this is another quasi malignant disease, uh, if you wish, that can explain to an extent the cellular vascularity or the cellularity in the vessels of the, uh, uh, of the blood. This is just what I talked about, that the apoptosis will be lost and the, the proliferation of the cells will be uncontrolled and the progenitor cells, they come from the bone marrow in a malignant uh, fashion. Endothelin is a bad uh, uh, molecule. It is uh, very vasoconstrictive and it's a mutagenic even. It can cause uh, cancer. Sometimes this endothelin might be produced in significantly larger amount in these patients that lead to the changes. And this has been proven in pulmonary hypertension patients that the levels are high and the uh, consequences are high. And this is even on the pathology showing when you look into the receptors that the representation of the receptors in the PAH uh, uh, pathology is very uh, strong. And that means the, the blood vessel is more prone to having vasoconstriction. And that's another theory for the development uh, uh, of the disease. Uh, the other forms, for example, in heart failure, I explained that earlier that when you do have uh, um, a problem in the hyperdynamic circulation, the blood volume that goes to the lung is too much with the chronicity, this might lead to endothelial cell injury. And again, we will go through the cycle of having a proliferation and sometimes uh, vasculopathy similar to the PAH in nature. Uh, another form of the disease, the pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, the pathology is in the post capillaries in the venules. And you'll start seeing all these loop-like alveolar capillary dilatations. And that's where the pathology is. That's where the uh, uh, condition that leads to the pulmonary hypertension. This is a unique form of the disease that is approached differently. Most of these patients, they would require lung transplantation. And recently, there was a separate gene identified as the cause for the uh, uh, pulmonary capillary uh, uh, and uh, for the other forms of uh, pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. And this is the gene that I refer to that was very well identified from uh, uh, French uh, folks. Uh, these are the list of the drugs that can associated with pulmonary hypertension. Some of these drugs and historically in the 70s and late 60s, uh, Fenfen, it's one of the obesity agents that was very famous in Europe. People used it. Thousands of people developed pulmonary hypertension because of the use of these agents. And alongside, there is some other agents that like cocaine and the, the, the type of stimulant therapy. We always worry about methamphetamine. In our part of the world, captagon is something that we do not like because it is an amphetamine in a way or another. And I had uh, probably historically taken care of two or three patients who uh, have pulmonary hypertension who admitted to using significant amounts of captagon. Uh, in the West, in the US, methamphetamines are common. And, uh, you know, that we've seen cases definitely there. Some of these agents, like the satinib, for example, it is a chemotherapy, and we have uh, uh, some cases that very well reported in literature that they developed pulmonary hypertension after being treated for uh, CML with the satinib leading to the pulmonary hypertension to the point where it's one of the different causes uh, of it. The toxic uh, rapeseed oil uh, that was in the uh, late 70s, early 80s in Spain, they were selling uh, cheap olive oil. Now we are the olive oil people, but they were mixing the olive oil with other uh, substances. And these substances actually were you know, discovered to be toxic. Again, lots of patients they have a very bad lung injury from it, some of whom developed pulmonary hypertension. And uh, of course, it was eventually figured out the cause of this. And it was mainly limited to Spain for that particular reason. 
Connective tissue disease is common. We said we have a lot of patients, young with SLE, different forms of connective tissue disease, and they form about a quarter of the patients in most of the registries. This is a US registry. And even outside, the, you know, when you have uh, rheumatological centers, they do see a significant number of patients who can develop pulmonary hypertension due to connective tissue disease. For example, scleroderma is very famous. Uh, some reports uh, uh, says up to 28% of cases with scleroderma, they can develop pulmonary hypertension. I would say it's probably less but it is definitely around 10% or more. And look what happens when these scleroderma patients start developing pulmonary hypertension. The outcome is significantly worse. Now, this is, you know, it's a bad disease to have. When they start having lung involvement, things get a little worse, but definitely with pulmonary hypertension, the outcome and survival is much, much worse. Uh, they also tend to be worse when they are treated as, as compared to the pulmonary arterial hypertension. The idiopathic form, they have a little bit poorer response uh, uh, to therapy. We talked about the liver disease, HIV, and all these diseases, uh, pulmonary diseases that can lead to uh, uh, fibrosis and destruction of the blood vessels definitely can lead to elevation in the pulmonary vascular resistance. Again, cigarettes and toxins and the obesity, hypercapnia, that can lead to elevation in the pulmonary uh, uh, pressure. The other special form of pulmonary hypertension is the CTEF, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. This is a CT scan of a patient with CTEF. We don't see obstruction as we normally see. And the VQ scan, not many people do VQ scan, but you can see there is no blood that's reaching the blood vessels. We see some chronic fibrotic changes inside this. This is a web, it's called, and the blood vessel is occluded with a clot. This disease is unique because it's a surgically treated disease and potentially curable disease. This is after removal of the clot, things normalizes, and these patients tend to do very well. But the surgery has to be, uh, uh, you know, unique surgery done in a special centers of, ex uh, you know, expertise in order to, you know, provide the patient with the best possible chances. We had many patients who were operated on, and actually they are leading a quite normal life. This is the material that come out of their lungs. We will not talk much about the CTEF uh, and this uh, awareness day, but this is the material that's causing the obstruction, that's causing the elevation and the, uh, uh, you know, pulmonary vascular resistance and uh, definitely explaining the symptoms of uh, the patient. We talked about the other hematological diseases uh, that are common. We see a lot of patients coming from uh, uh, the south and some in the west, probably you're from Jeddah. I'm sure you are seeing uh, some sickle cell patients as well and some other forms of diseases that are somewhat rare, kosher disease, neurofibromatosis, uh, pulmonary langel hand, uh, histiocytosis. These are rarer forms. They are not large enough to really put them uh, within the other groups of uh, uh, diseases because they are not very well uh, studied. So to wrap things up, we have a reason uh, genetic predisposition, some factor that can lead to vascular injury. This vascular injury will lead to inflammation. This is very well confirmed uh, uh, mechanism. And with this, the smooth muscles start being dysfunctional and proliferative. And endothelial cells, they will become dysfunctional. Eventually, this will lead to the vasculopathy and the disease progression and the presentation of the disease as we explained it in terms of right ventricular failure. I will stop here and I'll uh, have the mic uh, handed to uh, Dr. Shaya. In the meanwhile, I'll go through the comments and if there is, were any questions uh, to uh, address them through the talk. Dr. Shaya. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for your presentation. And, and uh, uh, I, will, I, will end, I will, sorry, I will start with uh, what Dr. Hassan ended. So Dr. Hassan uh, talked about the pulmonary hypertension classifications and uh, the differential diagnosis and the etiology of underlying diseases. So uh, from here, I'm going to talk about the diagnostic procedure in pulmonary hypertension and how we can deal with this. Uh, pulmonary hypertension, when you receive a, a consult or receive a referral uh, regarding pulmonary hypertension. Uh, I will open my slide in a second. So uh, uh, the idea from uh, our awareness today is uh, the pulmonary hypertension is an uncommon condition. And, and uh, unfortunately, there is a limited awareness. And sometimes people 
uh, wait for at least two years to reach to the pH specialist and, and, and start therapy or so on. So because of that, there is a delay in diagnosis in, in, in this serious diseases and delay initiation of therapy, and this potentially leads to a, a worse outcome and death in this kind of diseases. So early detection, early treatment, uh, better prognosis and better survival in this kind of diseases. So uh, how we can think and how we can uh, uh, diagnose this kind of diseases. Uh, there is a, a five group of pulmonary hypertension as mentioned by Dr. Hussam. All of these, we have to have like a pathway in how we can think and diagnose. First of all, we have a sign and symptoms of pulmonary hypertension and a high risk group of pulmonary hypertension. Let's just keep it in your mind when you think of a case of pulmonary hypertension. There is a diagnostic, there is a screening tools used to identify or help to reach a diagnosis. And also there is at end of this screening, there's a diagnostic test, reach a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. And then after that, we have to stratify our patient and uh, treat them and readjust their treatment based on the risk stratification. And today, inshallah ta'ala, we are going to talk about all these things uh, and, and brief. So uh, this graph has been shown by Dr. Hussam. Most of our patients fall in these two groups when there is delay in diagnosis and delay in referral of pulmonary hypertension cases. Uh, so symptomatic and decompensating or at time of decompensation and declining of right ventricle. So the pulmonary vascular pressure is, is, is increasing with the time of pulmonary hypertension. And you can see this uh, at time when patient coming at the end of, of his disease and try to push them back to the other, uh, other, uh, other lines. Uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance is increasing and pulmonary, pulmonary artery pressure with the time is goes down. So don't be fooled when the patient pressure is goes down, sometimes it indicates the advance of pulmonary hypertension. And the, uh, 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 and the uh, other side, the cardiac output is goes down as a consequence of this underlying failure of the right ventricle. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, the cardiac output is goes down and the right atrial pressure is, uh, goes up as a consequence of underlying disease. So uh, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Hussam, there is a five groups. Uh, I, I, I hope you can understand and keep these in your mind. We have a group one, pulmonary arterial hypertension, group two, where there is a pulmonary hypertension secondary to lift heart disease. And we are going to talk about these. Pulmonary hypertension, group three, secondary to lung diseases and hypoxia. Group four, pulmonary hypertension, secondary to pulmonary obstruction, especially chronic thrombombolic pulmonary hypertension. Uh, group five, where there is mesolenius or multifactorial mechanism can fall on all these four groups. So uh, a pulmonary hypertension is a family of diseases. It's not just one disease, a family of disease we call pulmonary hypertension. So different causes, there's different approach. Why we are classify these patients two to five because different approach, different pathophysiology and different treatment. And we have to keep in our mind, this is called pulmonary arterial hypertension where there is a treatment, specific treatment can be used in those guys uh, uh, in this uh, type of groups. And, and the other groups is called non-pulmonary arterial hypertension, pulmonary hypertension. So all are pulmonary hypertension, but the first one is pulmonary arterial hypertension. And the other groups, there is underlying specific disease, pathophysiology can be treated in different ways. Okay, so this has been shown by Dr. Hussam, pulmonary arterial hypertension in group one, and subclasses including idiopathic heritable drug induction or associated condition or lung responder. And this has been changed recently in 2018 and added to the groups or classification for arterial hypertension secondary to long term responder to calcium channel blockers and PVOD and others. A group two, where there is a, a heart failure with the Brazil ejection fracture, the reduced ejection fracture, fibular disease, or congenital acquired cardiovascular conditions causing left heart disease. Group three, where there is a lung disease or hypoxia like obstructive lung disease, COBD, or restrictive lung disease like interstitial lung disease, or combined disease between these two, or disease can cause hypoxia, chronic hypoxia, or developmental diseases. Group four, where there is pulmonary artery obstruction, and people are just as a thought that group four is just a chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension or called CTEF. Actually, it is CTEF and other, where there is pulmonary artery obstruction causing either in, uh, internal obstruction or external obstruction of pulmonary arteries. Uh, the, uh, the fifth one is unclear or multifactorial mechanism causing pulmonary hypertension, not fall to one of these groups. Uh, so we receive referrals, uh, whether you are a BH specialist or, or internist, uh, pulmonologist, cardiologist, you may see these kind of referrals. You see you, uh, people refer to you a patient with signs, symptoms may suggest pulmonary hypertension. 
or receive a consult regarding a high risk population from a hypertension like a scleroderma. Uh, the third uh, uh, kind of referral, you can receive a consult where there is a screening tool used and told you there is a science may suggest pulmonary hypertension like echocardiogram. Or let's say you receive a consult uh, regarding a patient who's already established diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension in his therapy. So these kinds kind of referrals can, you can receive, and you need to do something for those, those kind of patients. So uh, let's take it one by one. So sign of symptoms of pulmonary hypertension is always unspecific and can be mimic some other diseases of pulmonary or cardiovascular diseases, like exertional shortness of breath, which is one of the main symptoms that starts the patient with functional class one, then end with functional class four. So you might, you might see the patient in one of these during this period. So exertional shortness of breath, exertion of chest pain, lightheadedness or syncope, or signs of right side heart failure. And there's other signs can mimic others, but this is the main symptoms of pulmonary hypertension. So either signs, uh, sorry, symptoms or signs of pulmonary hypertension, when you do the physical examination, you can uh, have a, a, a second heart sound, a loud second heart sound, uh, a right ventricular heave, a uh, high GVB, a uh, hepatojugular reflex, a uh, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, lower limb swelling, a tricuspid uh, regurgitation, pulmonary regurgitation murmurs, and uh, SO3 gallop. Uh, this is a, a physical finding. You can see it in pulmonary hypertension. Uh, maybe find it incidentally, or you are sure there's a pH, and you find these kind of, of physical uh, uh, signs. Sometimes we have a sign symptoms, but sometimes we have a high risk population like a scleroderma, and you need to investigate them further because they are at high risk of progression and mortality if you didn't discover it early, especially in this kind of high risk of patients. So what the workup is, uh, are needed in this kind of diseases? So there are a lot of workup. It's a comprehensive workup of pulmonary hypertension. So I will just mention some of the important workup that needed and seen in pulmonary hypertension. First of all is ECG. So you might see the uh, uh, right atrial, uh, uh, right axis deviation, uh, right bundle, bundle brush block, or B pulmonary and pulmonary hypertension. Uh, uh, blood tests, including uh, PMB, connective tissue disease, immune marker, hepatitis, HIV, uh, biochemistry and hematological and thyroid function tests, because all these can be used either uh, for uh, uh, to help enrich diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension or underlying disease, or as a prognostic factor like PMB or previous uh, uh, PMB. Uh, other important tests in pulmonary hypertension is pulmonary function test and, and blood gases and six minute walk test. As I mentioned before, it can be used as a prognostic factor or diagnostic factors, a screening tool, like patient with has, uh, has uh, isolated DLCO and all other uh, parameter and, and PFT is normal. So you may think this is goes with underlying pulmonary hypertension and you need to discover it. Six minute walk test. Uh, it's used to, 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 to uh, determine exactly where is the patient in terms of functional capacity in pulmonary hypertension. Cardiopulmonary exercise test is important to differentiate between pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension, and cardiac and deconditioning, deconditioning diseases. Uh, a VQ scan is important to rule out underlying CTF, so it is, has a high sensitivity and high specificity in pulmonary hypertension, uh, and specifically in, 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 in chronic thrombotic pulmonary hypertension rule in or roll out. Uh, chest tomography is, is important uh, because to see the underlying disease like a group three where there is uh, involvement of parenchyma, so we have to differentiate group three from other groups. At the sound abdomen, when we have to look for portal pulmonary hypertension or liver cirrhosis. So all these workup always then initially, either incidentally or as a part of the uh, workup of pulmonary hypertension. So let us go to the next step of, of, of workup. You may receive a patient with echocardiogram finding, and we have to keep in your mind the echocardiogram is a screening tool. It's not a diagnostic tool. You cannot start pulmonary hypertension target therapy without doing right heart cath. We are not starting therapy in echocardiogram. You have to keep it in your mind. There is no way starting therapy with echocardiogram. Echocardiogram is a helping screening tool. You have to do right heart cath before starting and esta to establish a diagnosis and start the therapy because there is multiple underlying reasons for this. However, the echocardiogram, uh, there is a, a probability for echocardiogram to determine whether this is a pulmonary hypertension or there is no pulmonary hypertension. So uh, uh, the, the e, uh, SCARS guideline in 2015 mentioned these uh, 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 
criteria or probability of echocardiogram. So of the tricuspid regurgitation velocity less than 2.8 or more than 3.4, and there is in between. And uh, the uh, tricuspid regurgitation velocity is used to determine the right ventricular systolic pressure, not the mean pulmonary artery pressure. So we are using this uh, parameter to determine the right ventricular systolic pressure. So either we are seeing the pressure or we are seeing the signs suggesting of pulmonary hypertension, like there is right atrial, uh, right ventricular dilatation, right atrial dilatation, right ventricular dysfunction, flattening of the interventricular septum, uh, large of pulmonary artery, enlargement of right atrial, uh, atrium, and uh, fullness of IVC. So either we are seeing a pressure by calculating the pressure by using the tricuspid regurgitation velocity, or there is a signs of pulmonary hypertension in the right side of the echocardiogram, uh, or in between. So use this parameter, and I think it's important to take a capture screen for this echocardiogram to determine whether there is a pulmonary hypertension or there is no pulmonary hypertension. I didn't say pulmonary artery hypertension, it's a pulmonary hypertension. Then we have to go again to look for the underlying causes of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so, uh, just to make it clear for some people who is not uh, understanding what does mean of uh, tricuspid regurgitation velocity, it's almost equal to 35 right ventricular systolic pressure. We are not talking about the diagnostic and the uh, criteria in the, in the uh, right heart cast. So, the echocardiogram can see the right ventricular systolic pressure less than 35 of the TRV jet 2.8 or it looks like more than 50, more than 3.4. And this is uh, uh, some patient with uh, a pulmonary hypertension and the echocardiogram typical for chamber, whether the right ventricle is larger than the, right, than the left ventricle, the right atrium is larger than the, the, the left atrium. And this is another a short axis view, whether it's the left ventricle is pushed, and this is interventricular septum. You can see that the interventricular septum is is paradoxically movement moving because of the increase of pressure and volume in the right side of the heart. Uh, so uh, and this is a normal patient with the right ventricle is always smaller than the left ventricle. When we have the opposite side, the opposite uh, idea where there is a, a right ventricle is larger than the left ventricle. So we have a sign suggesting pulmonary hypertension and we have to go further with the investigation according to underlying clinical probability of the echocardiogram and the screening tools. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, TRV max in this, uh, 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 this is schedule, uh, this is a graph. Uh, we are calculating this number and to put it in, a, in, in an equation, and uh, based on this equation, we are calculating right ventricular systolic pressure. And this is always written in the echocardiogram according to the local uh, uh, echocardiographer in your institute. So uh, there is a confusion always between the echocardiogram and right heart cat when you are seeing uh, the, 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 the report. So when you have see uh, 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 echocardiogram, most of the time they are mentioning right ventricular systolic pressure and pulmonary artery systolic pressure. While in the, in the right heart cath, we are seeing the systolic pulmonary artery pressure, the historic pulmonary artery pressure, and the mean pulmonary artery pressure. Uh, and there's multiple reason why we are not uh, uh, making the, the, the echocardiogram uh, as a diagnostic tool, and we make it at like uh, a screening tool because there is sometimes the echocardiogram is over and underestimating of pulmonary artery from day to another day. When we have echocardiogram criteria or probability, we have to look for the underlying diseases. Do we have a symptomatic patient? Is he symptomatic? He has a symptoms plus he has a risk factor or a, a risk factor or there is no risk factor because this make a, a big difference. Should we go further with the right heart cat or we shouldn't go to the right heart cat? So if the echocardiogram probability is low and there is no uh, a risk factor for uh, uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension or so CTF, you may have to think about alternative diagnosis. But let's say if there is a risk factor with pulmonary arterial hypertension, let's say it's a Leo, scleroderma or so on, or CTF, so you have to do serial echocardiogram and this by the, the guideline in 2015. While the patient has intermediate risk without risk factor and he is symptomatic, you may go ahead with right heart cast. Uh, but uh, either way, in the intermediate group, you have to go ahead to right heart catheterization if there is a signs of pulmonary hypertension uh, uh, condition associated with CTEF. 
So uh, again, the uh, transthoracic echo remains the most important non-invasive screening tool, and the right heart catheterization remains the mandatory established diagnosis and before starting the therapy. Here are some of the normal values of right heart catheterization, or the pressure in the, in the heart, and sometimes we are used to determine whether it's normal or abnormal. Uh, however, this is this one GANS uh, catheter. Uh, at the end of the tip of the catheter, there's a, a balloon or dilated in the one area, and we can determine exactly the pressure there. Uh, this is one of our patients. We have a, 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 a balloon catheter in the right atrium, and then advanced to right ventricle, and then advanced to the wedge. And then when we have in between the right ventricle and the wedge, there is a pulmonary artery, we can determine the pressure. And this is one of the, our patients when we are trying to advance the, the catheter toward the pulmonary artery, then the wedge, uh, uh, wedge to the capillaries. So each area and pulmonary uh, and, and the heart, there is a specific waveform, and we can identify exactly where we are. So in the right, uh, right atrium, and this is the right ventricle, then the pulmonary artery, and then the wedge pressure. So each one of them has a specific criteria, specific tool, specific waveform, and we can identify our area even without seeing the, the, uh, the floral scan. Uh, However, what is about the evidence, level of evidence of doing right heart catheterization of pulmonary hypertension? So the right heart cath is recommended to confirm the diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension group two and to support the treatment decision. And this is a class one level C. So the pulmonary hypertension and ward symposium uh, 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 and pulmonary hypertension, uh, the fifth world symposium of pulmonary hypertension, it was in 2013, defining the pulmonary hypertension is the mean pulmonary artery pressure more than 25. And then when we have to define pulmonary arterial hypertension, we have to have a three criteria where the mean pulmonary artery pressure more than 25, the wedge pressure less than 15, and the BVR the pulmonary vascular resistance more than three. Uh, then in 2018, they made some more, a uh, little bit of changes. They call it pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, and this fall uh, groups one, three, and four, and some of five. They have a pre-capillary component or isolated post capillary component where there is a group two left heart disease. Uh, uh, also, the other uh, important change is changing the mean pulmonary artery pressure from 25, as I mentioned before, in 2013 to 2018, they mentioned the mean pulmonary artery pressure is 20 because the previous uh, 25 was arbitrary uh, number. And uh, this is more scientific toward the normal. The normal pulmonary artery pressure, uh, mean pulmonary artery pressure is 14 plus minus three. And with the two standard deviation, the normal pulmonary artery pressure is less than 20. Anything above 20 is abnormal. So when we have this, these three criteria is confirming the diagnosis of three capillary component, whether it's a group one, three, or four, or five, uh, or we have isolated uh, component uh, where there is a pressure, a pulmonary vascular resistance less than three, and the wedge pressure more than 15, and opposite to the others. And when there is a combined disease, when we have a pressure more than 20, a wedge pressure more than 15, the pulmonary vascular resistance more than three. Uh, one slide about the calcium channel responder. Sometimes we need to do a right heart catheterization with vasoreactive test. And specifically, when we are going to do a specific, uh, when we do a right heart catheterization for preemptive or pre-thinking, this is likely idiopathic, heritable or drug-induced pulmonary arterial hypertension. And this is based on your unsophistication and clinical suspicions. And the, 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 the responder, when there is a reduction of mean pulmonary artery pressure more than 10, to reach a value of mean pulmonary artery pressure less than 40, and there is no uh, change in cardiac output or there's increase in cardiac output. Let's say we have a mean pulmonary artery pressure is 45, minus four equal to 35. So this is a, a, a true responder where we have mean pulmonary artery pressure 45 minus nine, uh, and it is for less than 40, 36. This is not a responder because there is no reduction by 10. If we have a patient with mean pulmonary artery pressure 55, there is reduction by 10, but it reached to 45. So it's not reaching less than 40. This is no response. So there is no response, no response, and there's a response uh, with uh, uh, nitric oxide or uh, any other mimickers. So uh, we uh, have talked about 
the sign symptoms diagnostic tools, echocardiogram, right heart characterization, and the parameters. So we have a sign symptoms, probability of the echo. Then we have to identify our patient. Is this like a, a low probability? So we may consider other causes, or it is intermediate or high causes of pulmonary, uh, uh, inter, uh, high probability of pulmonary hypertension. So you have to go further if you have these tools to do to, to rule out CTF by doing VQ scan and to do further testing for group two and group three pulmonary hypertension, lung diseases and left heart disease. If there is none of these, you may consider uh, looking for the group one pulmonary hypertension. If you have no, uh, if you don't have these uh, facilities, go ahead directly and refer to the uh, centers where there is expert in pulmonary hypertension to do further testing. Uh, uh, again, this is a classification, group one, pulmonary artery hypertension, group two, left heart disease, group three, left lung, lung diseases, pulmonary obstruction, obstruction including CTF, and there is uh, group five, where is multifactorial mechanism of pulmonary hypertension. Most of our patients fall between the group two, left heart disease, and the group three, uh, lung diseases. And this is the majority of patients from hypertension. We can see group one and group four, but they are, they are the minority of the patient. And they, are, they have specific uh, way of treatment and we are going to talk about it today. Uh, just a few slides about group two, group three, and group four, just in a few slides. The group uh, two is including systolic diastolic vapor disease or, or uh, cardiomyopathy or congenital cardiomyopathies. Uh, if we have a, a pre- uh, the CAS uh, clinical diagnosis or diagnostic tool used, should we go further with doing heart catheterization or not? We have to apply the probability of left heart disease. We have to understand, do we have a left heart disease component or not before go further with investigation and think of the therapy. So if the patient has high probability, meaning the age more than 70, he has some metabolic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, uh, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, patient with cardiac intervention in the past, like cabbage or, uh, or PCI with stenting, atrial fibrillation, there is a structural left heart disease, uh, abnormality, echocardiogram like left atrial dilatation, and so on. So if we have a bunch of these, so we have to think about probability is high, indicating left heart disease. You may, you may not go further with investigation and do a right heart cat. You go ahead with, with treating the underlying disease, which left heart disease. And based on this, you can go ahead with the right heart cat if it is low probability of pulmonary hypertension. And again, uh, in the left heart disease, the guidelines suggesting that the use of pulmonary arterial hypertension approved therapy is not recommended. We shouldn't use pH target therapy in group two. And this is based on your clinical suspicious diagnostic tools before uh, starting this therapy. So uh, uh, group three, uh, a lot of diseases you have mentioned before, and again, group three, you shouldn't start therapy. The, the guideline 2015 uh, uh, say that the use of the drug approved for pulmonary artery hypertension is not recommended, not recommended in patients with pulmonary hypertension due to lung diseases. However, there is some controversy regarding the new study in 2021. Uh, there's some improvement. However, till the next guideline, we have to say that there is no recommended therapy for group three and group two, as mentioned before. And I'll just skip this slide. When we have to diagnose and differentiate between the group three and group one, because the group one and the group three, they have almost the same hemodynamic, right heart cath echocardiogram criteria. And we have to identify if this group three or group uh, one based on the CT scan and the extensive parenchymal changes, or there is no extensive parenchymal changes, or if there is a size or a, a significant reduction in pulmonary function test, like if AV1 is than 60 or PC less than 70. And based on this, we have to differentiate between group three and group one. Uh, what about the CTF and group four? It is not just a uh, pulmonary obstruction or thrombus, it is more than that. So it is a, a, a Inflammatory uh, inflammation with pulmonary uh, blood obstruction and can lead to, to arteriopathy, uh, venous and capillary diseases. So it's not just a, 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 a thrombus and obstruction. VQ scan uh, is important in, in patients with, uh, uh, with suspicion of uh, CTEF because of the high sensitivity and high specificity. Sensitivity means there is ruling out the disease. So it has negative, high negative predictive value with 99% sensitivity in VQ scan, comparing to the CTPA where there is a sensitivity of 51%, you miss half of the cases because of this. So, but the specific specificity, if we have a patient with CTEF or pulmonary, uh, 
complementary embolism, the higher the specificity is high in both. Uh, uh, this is a patient where there is normal ventilation, there is normal parenchyma, and there is normal perfusion in this kind of case. By, while we have a patient with a CTEF, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, they have normal parenchyma, but there is decreased perfusion, heterogeneity of the blood vessels, perfusion, and blood flow. So this is indicate there is obstruction in the blood flow and may indicate the underlying CTEF and pulmonary hypertension. There's another example where there is normal ventilation, either ways, either uh, views, and decrease in perfusion and heterogeneity of the perfusion, either in the right and the left lung. Sometimes the CTF is just obvious. We have significant signs, symptoms for quite a long time. It's not acute. We are not talking about acute, but there's a chronic safety symptoms. CTF can be for to have a, a PE, and now there's a persistent of the PE. So the other lung is obstructing. There is decrease in perfusion in the lung, and the VQ scan is confirming that the, the hyperperfusion, uh, the uh, CTF. Uh, it uh, has a specific way of treatment, like either they have operable or non-operable, and we have to send them for uh, to, to the uh, center where there is pulmonary thromboendotectomy is available because it is considered as somehow curable, curable disease. If it's not, or there's some recurrence or persistent pulmonary hypertension post surgery, there is another option like treatment, uh, medical therapy, uh, and planned pulmonary angioplasty. Uh, there's some examples of different classes of uh, different uh, uh, classes of of uh, CTEF and different sizes, segmental, subsegmental, and uh, and main pulmonary arteries. And you can see it's just not a thrombus. This is a, a, a fibrous tissues and vasculopathy uh, taken out from during the, the procedure. So pulmonary hypertension is a comprehensive workup and need multidisciplinary team discussion to reach a diagnosis. So once you establish a diagnosis, you need to then go ahead with the risk stratification treatment algorithm and follow up a plan. And we are going to talk about that uh, later on. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, please put your question in the Q&B box and we're gonna uh, answer your question, me or Dr. Hassan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shaya, for this uh, very comprehensive review of the diagnostic part. Uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about the importance of early detection. Some of what uh, has been already mentioned will be repeated, but in a more clinical format. So uh, you will see a lot of pictures, a lot of x-rays, and uh, some of the interesting stuff. So these are the different classes or groups of patients who can develop pulmonary hypertension. And as you can notice, the survival is you know, various between these people, but having pulmonary hypertension is a bad disease. Uh, some questions came, I will address them through my talk, but it does affect young people. The average age in our clinics is in their mid thirties. I do have patients who are younger and I do have patients who are older. In the West, the average number, you know, age is somewhat older. In Germany, for example, it can reach in the 60s. Uh, in the States, in the 50s, and France, I think it's in the 50s. Uh, but it does affect young people, and uh, the probability of survival over the years is significantly reduced for somebody who's in their 30s to tell them, Wallahi, in five years, your probability of being alive is only uh, uh, two-thirds there is 30% chance of you being dead within five years. Of course, we're Muslims, we understand our uh, faith, and, uh, uh, but in terms of, of uh, diseases and in terms of medicine, we can understand that this is something that is unexpected. The congenital heart disease uh, has the best prognosis. We have a lot of patients who are chronically uh, uh, you know, ill with even cyanosis, Eisenmenger syndrome. They tend to do better. And when it comes down to connective tissue disease and HIV diseases, these people, they don't do as well as uh, we like them to do. So it's a bad disease to begin with. And even within the different classes of group one pulmonary uh, arterial hypertension, the prognosis might differ. The story is changing with therapy. This is the observed, uh, uh, this is a somewhat older slide, but the, the importance is that with therapy, things improve. This line here, you can see the, uh, um, uh, the, the colored one is the traditional expected outcome. And it was really bad when they studied the disease for the first time in the 1980s. The publication came in 1987, and it showed that the probability three-year survival is only 50% uh, or less. So this is not, not good news, definitely, uh, uh, for patients who are relatively young to have this kind of survival. 
Now, with therapy, things are still not perfect. You know, you can treat them with the most advanced therapy and still they are not perfect. These studies were done when the patients were sicker and they come uh, present in a late functional class. New York Heart Functional Class 3 and 4 is where the disease was being talked about early in the days when the uh, resources are limited, the knowledge is somewhat uh, uh, limited in the disease. So patients were identified when they are becoming somewhat sick, they have significant symptoms. Functional Class 3 is really limited and Functional Class 4 is premorbid. And you can see the cumulative survival even is much significantly less when the patients present with florid heart failure than when they are somewhat uh, uh, symptomatic. So this, this is a very strong uh, slide and that was repeated in many studies showing the same idea. The, the more advanced the functional class the patient is at during the diagnostic part, the worse outcome they have. Now, this is a summary slide, it's very busy, but I will just go through some of it quickly with you. These are registry data from different countries. Uh, there is from US, Spain, UK, France, uh, Germany, and it shows you the survival over one, two, three, and five years. And it's variable, but in general, in the US registry, and these people are uh, uh, real life studies. These are the as real life patients who are being treated uh, by their physicians according to what is needed. Most of these patients are on uh, combination therapy. And when you look over them over years, if you see in the red, this is the US registry at five years, still the survival is about in the 50s to 60s. And this is, this is not good. Similar thing as when you look into the, uh, uh, you know, compare a study in, in, the, in Germany, there were some distinction between the ages. If the patient is really old, it might make a difference between old versus a little bit younger. Spanish, uh, French registry is again showing a three-year survival uh, in the 70s uh, in general, between uh, 69, 71. So this is still not good. This is now with the best practices in very good centers, very advanced countries, patients with pulmonary hypertension, they still have very, uh, unfortunately low survival rates when it comes down to therapy. Yet it is much better than when we started where these people sometimes they, they were dead very quickly. There was a, you know, this is a meta-analysis of the published trials showing that when you start treating patients, there is a relative reduction of mortality by 43%. At one point, a few years ago, we were questioned that these medications are somewhat expensive, somewhat uh, not very available. Uh, would it make a difference really to treat these patients with these expensive drugs? And this helped us a lot in proving that when you treat the patients, Yes, they do get better and you have 43% reduction in mortality. And of course, there is a significant reduction in the probability of hospitalization, which is another important indicator that the patients are not just spending their life in the hospital, yet they are somewhat functional. So again, treating patients does make a difference in the outcome and the improvement over the years. Uh, uh, if you see here, it was 35% traditionally at five years. It's 64, and I would say it's a close to doubling the survival. Still, we have some room to go. At one year, 90% survival currently. At three years, 74% survival. At five years and uh, later on, it, it keeps decreasing. And this is something that we, we are really eager to make a difference and uh, improve the survival for these patients. Within the same set of data, if you look at the people when they present at lower functional class in the red up, their survival is not as bad as I showed you. The whole group, you look at the collective number of the patients, the survival is not great. But there is a clear distinction in the survival between the groups according to their functional class. So if they present with functional class four, meaning they come to the emergency room, similar to what I described to you, their chances of survival is very, very small and they, are, they tend not to do very well. But if you catch them earlier, probably their chances of, with therapy, their chances is much better to survive that. This has been repeated and looked at in different registers, different diseases, uh, uh, with different therapies even. So this study, for example, looking at from 2013, showing the functional class four, only 29% versus 84% when you catch them in earlier functional class. This data is from the initial registry, uh, uh, the NIH registry, I didn't tell you about that, but the disease was studied in 1981 to 84, three year worth of just collecting data on a, on a drug, on a, mid, uh, on, on a disease that nobody knew much about. At that, before that point, there were some few case reports, but this registry that was led by Stuart Rich has shed a lot of light on the uh, nature of the disease as we know it. It takes an average, 
two years to diagnose a patient with pulmonary hypertension from the beginning of the symptoms until establishing the diagnosis. This is all data from the 80s. Again, the disease was rare. The disease was not uh, very well uh, studied. There is not much information about it. There's no treatment even available for it. So you can understand that, that delay. Some patients, of course, it took them longer, but in average, it took uh, more than two years to diagnose it. More recent study from 2009 from Australia. Now we always look at the Australian system as a you know a modern advanced healthcare system that uh, is simulating our healthcare system by virtue of numbers. And uh, this is just another you know just discouraging uh, publication. Small number of patients. Uh, but they looked into the people who were diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension. It took 47 months to establish a diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension on them. And it just looked further into an average, it takes many consultants at different levels, an average five GP. So the patient was seen by five different general practitioners and at least uh, uh, three probably specialists. Yani eight physicians have seen the patient, specialists including pulmonologists, cardiologists, without establishing the diagnosis. And they were giving at least two other alternative diagnoses before we establish your problem is related to pulmonary hypertension. And this is by itself is very strong indicator of either really we don't see these, these patients that much or there is a very significant uh, uh, unawareness of the disease. Now, they looked back at the time of the presentation when they start having the symptoms, when they could have been picked up and diagnosed, majority of the cases were in functional class two. As expected, early, they are still having early in their disease. As it takes longer to be diagnosed, they transform into functional class three and four. And I just showed you earlier evidence that the earlier you start therapy with these people, the better their overall survival. And this is something that is bothersome. This is something that we are trying to make a difference with it. Symptomatology over time, I showed you this earlier. Patients can accommodate early on. There is no nothing to feel after a while and after establishment of the disease. Early symptoms at this phase, imagine the disease has been ongoing for some time and we are even losing more time by ignoring the, uh, like, you know, the initial symptoms of the disease until they come when they are deteriorating, they're declining, they have to be hospitalized or come to the emergency room, uh, you know, this is something that we are trying to really uh, uh, make a difference in it. And I showed you this lady when she died, this takes months and years for this full establishment of the vasculopathy. It does not happen over a short period of time where the person will be suddenly dead. It will take time for the remodeling, for the uh, proliferation of the cells. And we at one point should think of it and suspect it and pick on it. When the disease was described, there was one therapy available. I showed you in 1996, it was an IV therapy. We'll talk about therapies later on. But at that time, the disease was studied in its advanced form, functional class three and four, and nobody thought to treat this disease earlier, similar to any other disease. We don't know much information. Up until 2008, by then, there were some other agents available, oral therapies, inhaled therapies, subcutaneous therapies were available. And they did this study on early study. It's called early study. They said, what about if we treat patients who are in functional class two? Small number of patients, 81 and 82 people, they are by definition, by guidelines, they should not be treated because the approval of the drug was for functional class three and above. And they gave a group of them 81 uh, uh, therapy and the other group, they said, we will monitor them and observe them and see what happens. Now, treating earlier, and the medicine was Bozentan, treating them earlier has improved their pulmonary vascular resistance. So this is something that was seen under, under normal circumstances. These people would have not given therapy, but the PVR has improved. The six minute walk distance again is improved significantly in terms when you treat earlier. And it's fitting nicely with the graphs that I showed you. If you diagnose them early, meaning that you are gonna treat them early, you will make a difference in their exercise capacity and in their hemodynamics. And of course, this will be reflected into their longer term outcome in terms of clinical worsening, the, the mortality and the need to start other therapies. People who were treated earlier, they definitely did better than the people who were monitored until they have an indication to start therapy. And after that point, 
the medications has been studied in functional class two to show a benefit and FDA and all the regulatory bodies, they are approving the drugs to be paid for when they are in an earlier functional class. This is, this is a very important uh, concept now. Nobody can imagine leaving a patient with pulmonary hypertension diagnosis, even if their symptoms are very mild without therapy. Another concept that uh, traditionally, this is a French data showing that these, these people who were presented in the registry, this is the majority of them were in functional class three and four. So only 12.5% of the patients were picked up earlier. So this is again reflective of the common practice in, the, in France. You're not talking about uh, any other country. So these are advanced countries. They implemented a screening program for scleroderma. We know scleroderma is commonly associated with It's diagnosed, or you can actively look for the uh, uh, patients who have the disease and look in their screening program. They discovered some patients in the in with pulmonary hypertension by looking for the disease rather than waiting for the symptoms. And about half of them were diagnosed in an earlier functional class. So again, this tells you in certain groups of patients, if you screen earlier, you are more likely to pick them up at an earlier functional class. And that will be reflected on their outcome because the ones who were treated early with the screening, their survival is significantly better than the ones who were picked up by development of symptoms and establishing the diagnosis the old, the classical, traditional way. So this is a very significant, strong study that indicates and fits into what we are talking about in terms of this uh, uh, lecture. So again, early detection is our goal. In order to diagnose these patients, you've heard about the diagnostic algorithm, but since the presentation is very non-specific, you have to keep an index of suspicion. You see more yeah, any general pulmonary cases or general causes for dyspnea than pulmonary hypertension, but some patients might fit some profile, especially if they are already known to have a risk factor for development of pulmonary hypertension or their symptoms has not improved with the traditional interventions that we do for the rest of our patients. You can always diagnose bronchitis. You can always assume this is a pneumonia. You can always assume this is an airway disease, but the response of therapy is not going to be optimum. And that's when you start thinking, what else could this be? What am I missing? Again, the, the mere fact that you know having a connective tissue disease like scleroderma or SLE puts the person is at risk of developing pulmonary hypertension will keep you aware that this patient is having some symptoms. Could this be the disease itself or something else? Same thing that applies to HIV, applies to congenital heart disease and the liver diseases that we are talking about. Symptoms are very nonspecific. You will not be able to diagnose a patient with pulmonary hypertension only by symptoms. Same thing as physical exam. Physical exam is great. Some question was about how about if we palpate P2? There will be elevation in the intensity of the uh, closure of the pulmonary valve because of the elevation of the pressure. But this is very nonspecific. It can be caused by any other diseases that increases the flow across the uh, pulmonic valve or just abnormality in the valve itself. But it is an indicator. It will give you a hint towards, well, like, this could be related to the pulmonary uh, hypertension as, as we, we uh, know it. I'll show you some pictures. This patient presented with hoarseness of voice. You know, she has a very dilated pulmonary artery. And there was another question about the aorta and dilatation. This is the pulmonary artery, and this is the aorta. Usually, the aorta is larger than the pulmonary artery. And one quick way to see if the pulmonary artery is enlarged is to compare it with the adjacent aorta. And if it's larger, that means it's larger. You know, the recurrent pharyngeal nerve will uh, make its way all the way, and it will make a sling, and it will go around the, uh, uh, the area here in the aorta. And sometimes this particular patient, I had few of them, it's called Ortner syndrome, where the encroachment of the pulmonary vessel and its dilatation leads to, uh, you know, hoarseness of voice. This is a very interesting case that we had, we had it here at KFMC, and this, is what, this was the presentation. We talked about physical examination. It's the physical exam of right heart uh, failure. You can hear nothing. You can start seeing a little bit elevation or loud P2. And of course, all the way to florid right-sided failure with ascites and lower extremity edema and JVP, depending on how advanced their representation is. And trust me, when the patient is decompensating, when the patient is in a florid right heart failure, that you don't need the doctor to tell that this patient is not doing well. And our role is to definitely intervene and pick on things before it's becoming obvious to any eye. 
ECG is a common, a common thing we do. Again, the ECG changes are not specific. This is a patient with pulmonary hypertension. You see very subtle changes in the ECG. Uh, and that can be normal. Sometimes the ECG of pH patients can be normal, but there will be some subtle changes. Classically, you will start seeing the prominence of the P2 in uh, lead two, the P wave, the, the, uh, it, it will be, so not the P, the S, it will be larger. And I'll show you some more pictures. You start, you might start seeing, look at the P wave here very very interesting very large it's relative to the qrs that's another indicator this patient is almost completely like you know uh, normal but if you look at the septal area here there's a little bit irregularity in the t wave and this is an indicator of uh, uh, right ventricular strain this is you cannot miss this uh, patient with the right bundle branch and of course the patient has pulmonary hypertension and sometimes like i said it can be normal few of these cases improve with uh, uh, therapies to the point where things gets better x-ray is another common thing anybody can do an x-ray this is a patient with uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension it's it's very simple the size of the heart is uh, borderline there are some elevation or more prominence in the pulmonary vasculature here not so much in in, in this one you might see them more advanced. Definitely, this is a very abnormal pulmonary artery. The size of the heart is on the larger border. Usually, the lungs are clear. Most of these times, the lungs are clear. If you start seeing pulmonary edema or infiltrates in the lung, the probability of PAH becomes less. This is another picture, an X-ray of a patient who nobody can miss. I mean, you might suspect that there is a higher pathology, but definitely you cannot miss and look into the pulmonary uh, artery indentation into the left border of the heart. Look at this, you know, this is a very abnormal, nobody should miss this, but we don't have to pick it up when it becomes this bad. You know, you should be able to uh, be more probably alert, attentive, and vigilant for the changes that takes place in this. This is almost a mass in the hilum, but this patient has pulmonary uh, hypertension causing this abnormality. And as you can see it, the, 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 uh, the right side of the heart is very dilated. And of course, there's enlargement of the pulmonary vasculature. And when you look at the CT scan, this is the X-ray now as a comparison to the CT scan, all this area is being pushed and enlarged by the enlarged right side of the heart. This is the right ventricle and uh, the left side is there. So all of the abnormality you see is caused by the pulmonary hypertension patient. This is an unfortunate young woman who came in pregnant, some questions about the pregnancy. And uh, uh, we were called to see her in the CCU after delivery. She went into shock and she was in bad shape. Uh, later on, it was confirmed to have pulmonary hypertension. She's known to have SLE. And she went through the pregnancy with uh, somewhat mild, uh, uh, you know, uh, distress, let's say. She was never bad, but uh, her symptoms were there even during the uh, pregnancy time. And after delivery, as expected, that uh, she went into this picture. We have her in the ICU. We had to treat her with IV therapy. And uh, so this is not an uncommon feature that you see them in a circumstance. Some questions on pregnancy came in the, in the audience. I'll address them now since we are talking about the pregnant patient. Pregnancy is, should be prohibited. Try to avoid pregnancy for the known patients. And if the patient is pregnant and they have pulmonary hypertension, there is a question about the mode of delivery. It will be better to deliver them by a planned delivery, not vaginal, probably cesarean section is a better approach. Uh, you try to use a spinal anesthesia rather than general anesthesia. And it is very much recommended that it is a multidisciplinary approach between the high risk pregnancy pulmonary hypertension expert and anesthesia on board in order to pull this patient through the shore of safety without having significant hemodynamic compromise around the time of delivery. Somebody asked about the CT scan. Look at this pulmonary artery. So this is much larger than the adjacent aorta. The unfolded aorta itself should not be affected by pulmonary hypertension. But if you compare the sizes, you can tell that there is a problem with the, uh, the cases. Uh, normally, we don't see the pulmonary artery in this uh, aortopulmonary window. This is a sign that was described. If you see it, that means the pulmonary artery is dilated. These are pictures from my patients. Normally, you see this at the time when the aortic arch is really starting to separate. We don't see the pulmonary artery. But when you start seeing this, these are PAH patients from my clinic. That shows that that means the pulmonary artery is really dilated. And sometimes it can be one of the signs. How do you pick up on the presence of pulmonary hypertension? 
The right side of the heart is definitely enlarged on the CT scan, and this is something that you can see it. The radiologist has to comment on it and pick on it. There was some uh, uh, pericardial effusion, again, that can have a you know, prognostic indicator that this patient is having a problem and probably a little bit worse outcome. Classically, if you read the radiology, you will see the, uh, um, uh, the blood vessels described on an X-ray that it will be tapered all the way till the periphery. And I think this is very nicely shown on a CT scan because the blood vessels are very opacified with the contrast and you see dilatation in the proximal part and then sudden narrowing of the blood vessels and it's called the pruning of the blood vessels. Supposedly it can be seen on an X-ray, but it can be more clearly seen on a CT scan of the chest. And sometimes you, if you have CTEF, you see the discrepancy between the uh, perfusion of these two lungs that might be uh, an indicator of vasculopathy, of course, chronic thromboembolic disease is one of it, but PAH can cause this, and this patient had uh, uh, abnormality in the parenchyma, showing that there is a small vessel uh, uh, disease. Echocardiogram, Dr. Shaya showed you, these are patients with pulmonary hypertension who have right-sided dilatation, and there is some tricuspid regurgitation. If you look at the D-shaped uh, uh, symptom, and the right side is significantly dilated. Normally, an echo sometimes normal people, you can barely see the uh, right side of the heart, but these patients, the right side of the heart is very obvious, prominent, and actually it's pushing the left heart, causing uh, some secondary diastolic dysfunction. And of course, the estimated pressures, uh, Dr. Shah went through this, will be significantly uh, high. We sometimes do exercise capacity tests for them, six-minute walk distance, showing that these are very severely limited. Young person who can walk only 162 meters in six minutes, that's, that's significant. And of course, we monitor their desaturation because with exercise, with similar to any other heart failure patients, sometimes they desaturate and they require a, a supplement of uh, oxygen. VQ scan is something that we, uh, again, uh, you know, subspecialty centers may, may be able to do it. And this patient has very abnormal VQ scan uh, because of chronic thromboemboli. It was missed as a PAH. We said we have to pick these cases early in order to refer them for surgical treatment because that might mean a cure uh, uh, for them. This is another example with uh, multiple defects and the ventilation scan is usually normal. These are just showing you, uh, uh, we discovered these patients Incidentally, by radiology, these patients had PET scan looking for some tumors and look at what happens. Normally, the left uh, uh, ventricle is very hyperactive, dynamic. The muscles in the left ventricle are, are big and it will light up on the PET scan. But look at this is a patient with pulmonary hypertension. The right side is lighting up, meaning that it's even more dynamic than the left. And there's a lot of pressure against which the right ventricle has to pump the blood. And it's very nicely, clearly shown uh, by a radiological uh, change. You've seen this algorithm. We have to always suspect pulmonary hypertension, suspected in the proper setting, in the proper symptoms, in the proper constellation of diseases that the patient might have. And then the next step is not just sit tight on them, try to establish the diagnosis and confirm it. Uh, you can start ruling out things, but if the patient clinically does not fit the heart failure phenotype or the cl chronic lung disease phenotype, probably they warrant ruling out pulmonary hypertension or ruling in pulmonary hypertension, referral to a center where they can establish this is uh, recommended. It's recommended to be done early in order to pick them up early and start treating them early. Even in the new proposed guidelines, they wanted fast track referral. So they wanted to encourage you immediately, if you really think this patient might have pulmonary hypertension, don't wait for the rheumatology screen. Don't wait for uh, some other workup to be completed just to fast track them, send them to a center of excellence where they can establish the diagnosis quickly. Even if they did not have pulmonary hypertension, at least they got the best possible chance of being diagnosed and initiate therapy on it. Right heart cath is hands down. You can get right heart cath uh, easily, safely, uh, available. Lots of people are doing it. You just, if you're a cardiologist, you refer to or the hospital you work in, they don't want to do right heart cath and you think the patient needs it, just refer it to us at PFMC. We will be very happy to accept it, whether we accept it to the pulmonary service or even cardiology. They are very good. They are very uh, willing to help these patients who might require invasive diagnostic procedures because it makes a difference. You cannot diagnose the disease. You cannot treat the disease without establishing the good diagnosis. Very, very few 
complications. It's listed there, but the probability of having complication from right eye cat is extremely low. And of course, the more you do them, the better you will get at them and the, even the uh, complication rate becomes less. I'll show you a couple of representative cases that I think they are interested. This is one of our nurses at KFMC. Uh, in 2008, she was employed. This is her X-ray at employment. This X-ray was even either not looked at or was passed as normal. But if you really, in retrospectively, you say, well, the, the heart shape and size does not look all normal. In 2011, she did have some illness. Uh, she's, she's a nurse. Uh, so she did an X-ray and definitely this is a, not a normal X-ray. Over a three-year period of time, the patient was okay. She's coming to work every day or for her shifts. But this X-ray was missed in 2011. And in 2013, I was in the emergency room seeing an ICU patient. And one of the folks in the ER approached me and said, will you take a look at our colleague? We have one of our nurses is not feeling well and she's having some chest tightness and uh, shortness of breath. So I looked at her and we immediately start working her up. This was her ECG. It's very bad. It shows really signs of right ventricular strain. And uh, we did the work up for her. This is her CT scan, did not show any clots. This is her echo. The echo was horribly abnormal, very dilated right side. All of this took place in the ER at the on the spot. And actually, we uh, uh, you know just took at this like D shape, the right side is dilated uh, of the heart. She's young, she's in her 30s. We immediately admitted her. We did the right heart cat for her, and she had very significantly elevated pulmonary artery pressure. The diagnosis was established. We did vasoreactivity testing for her. She was not vasoreactive, and immediately we started her on therapy. Today, she is still with us at KFMC on multiple agents and she's doing okay. She's still working and alhamdulillah, she's doing fine. This is another patient, unfortunate lady who came to, uh, she's young, uh, she's getting some a question about young, but yes, we do see younger patients. Uh, this lady had, um, uh, she was preparing for her wedding. She's engaged to be married and she was starting having symptoms. She went into a out of Riyadh facility, very good facility. They looked at her, they suspected that she might have an abnormality, cardiologist, they did an echo and they said, you know what, you do have uh, abnormal heart, go get married and uh, after you get married, come back to us. Uh, she was busy, she was as expected preparing for her uh, uh, marriage. With this X-ray, one day after a month from that incident, uh, she's, she's the newlywed, one month later, she comes to the emergency room with oxygen saturation of 66%. This was her X-ray. We immediately did an echo for her. I'm not sure this is going to be moving, but her echo is horrible. Very dilated right side and uh, uh, just showing tricuspid regurg. Uh, unfortunate for the first time that she lands in the emergency room. That's similar to what I described to you during the talk. Look at the P wave and the uh, and the uh, ECG. Look at her right side. It's you know, uh, leads showing very significant uh, strain pattern. Her uh, cat was very abnormal. Her PA pressure is extremely high. She was admitted to the ICU. We treated her with a triple therapy, including IV uh, prostacyclin until we stabilized her and we sent her home. The idea of our talk today, the idea of our program today is increase the awareness, whatever field you are in, you have to suspect the disease. And again, I will reiterate the probability of dealing with asthma is much higher than pH. The probability of dealing with a viral illness is much higher than pH. But some of these patients, they don't fit the classical uh, response to our interventions that we every day do on a lot of patients. Those are the ones that I would like to pay attention to them, especially if they have the background of a disease that can be associated with pulmonary hypertension. It's definitely worth asking the question, could this be something else, could this be pulmonary hypertension? And then just do the referral. Now we are open 24 seven accepting referrals. We can take care of anybody who needs our services. We have multiple you know, consultants in PH now, even in, in, in the uh, KFMC, including pediatrics, uh, cardiology, pulmonary, and even we have collaboration with other services. We have very advanced radiological uh, uh, equipments and techniques and even invasive procedures we do. So please, yeah, and feel free, if, if you suspect your patient is having pulmonary hypertension, refer them early so that we can establish the diagnosis early and the treat early to make a difference in their overall outcome. Uh, thank you for uh, you know, listening. And I will leave the stage now with Dr. Shaya, who will be talking to you uh, about some medications, the treating the disease, 
we diagnosed it, we established it, we have a good referral base and the patient does have pH. So how are we gonna approach these patients at this point? Dr. Shaya? Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassam, uh, for your excellent presentation. Uh, as always, uh, Dr. Hassam is my senior, so I was I'm impressed by his presentation, to be honest. So, um, as mentioned by Dr. Hassam, uh, primary hypertension is need to be uh, looked at, and and early detection always helps patients to, to to reduce the, the 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 mortality and morbidity in such such scenarios and improve their survival. Um, uh, now I'm going to talk about the treatment algorithm and that the medication that are available and in, in, in especially uh, specifically in King Fahad Medical City. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned before, uh, it is uncommon diseases, uh, limited awareness. Because of that, we are trying our best to increase this awareness by doing these kind of, of meeting and conferences. Uh, because of the delay of diagnosis, there is a delay in the in initiation of the therapy. And at, at the end, there's potential worsening outcome, including mortality and death. Uh, this is, has been uh, shown before regarding the, the, the problem and the culprit diseases uh, that, that there is uh, most of our patients came at a time of the symptomatic and decompensation. And sometimes they came at declining of the right ventricle and failure. And the right uh, pulmonary artery pressure, it is not the, the sole criteria to diagnose or to follow up the patient. So pulmonary artery pressure is always goes down at time of the failing, the heart the right ventricle. So we have to look into the right pulmonary uh, vascular disease and the right heart catheterization and the cardiac output as well as, as a poor indicator. You can see it's poor indicator increasing the PVR and decrease the cardiac output. Uh, why the pulmonary artery pressure goes down at the end of the disease. So it may indicate that the, the, the worst outcome in this kind of cases. So increasing the, 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 the pressure is not always meaning that is a, it is a bad, sometimes it's meaning it is fine, but goes down the pressure. It doesn't mean the pressure is goes down to the symptomatic or pre-symptomatic area. Actually, it may indicate the declining of the diseases and advanced disease. And this is what we have to keep in our mind. Why I'm saying that? Because the treatment algorithm and what we have to do, we have to be aggressive in such uh, uh, conditions. Uh, uh, the classifications, as mentioned before by Dr. Hussam, uh, the pulmonary artery hypertension in group one, and there is subclasses. And there is uh, this class has a vasculopathy and a specific targeted diseases. And a lot of studies uh, mentioned in the literature what we have to do for this kind of diseases and what treatment uh, can be used. Uh, uh, the other group, the group two, left heart disease, there is no treatment. It is a passive uh, backflow pressure to the pulmonary artery from the left side of the heart. And the treatment is to treat the heart, to treat the left side disease by diuretics at whatever underlying diseases like VAPA disease or systolic or diastolic heart failure. So treat left heart disease, you'll treat the underlying disease and the pressure will go down in the pulmonary arteries. Uh, uh, group three, pulmonary hypertension, second to lung diseases and hypoxia. So treat the hypoxia, treat the lung disease, the pressure will go down. So if you have CBD, ILD, you have to identify these cases and you have to treat them accordingly. Uh, a group four, there is pulmonary artery obstruction. There is a specific pathway to treat this kind of diseases. It, it is a, two, a, a constellation of two things. It is obstruction and vascular obesity. And because of that, there is endarctectomy at a surgery to remove this vascular fibrotic tissue. And also there's a specific target tre tre treatment can be used in this kind of treatment. So group one and group four, there is some way of treating them uh, and pH uh, uh, by pH specialist. A group five, some of you I just show uh, in the question and uh, uh, box, there is some uh, people ask about the group five. I have just to make it clear for everyone. The group five, there is a diseases where there is no clear uh, bathophysiology or treatment pathway. Uh, so let's say we have a scleroderma, uh, sorry, we have a skeletal disease. So skeletal disease can present with a group two pulmonary hypertension, like a heart failure because of skeletal disease, you have to treat the heart failure according, not to treat with pH target therapy. Uh, 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 skeletal disease can present with the group three like acute chest syndrome and chronic lung uh, uh, fibrotic changes because of recurrent uh, infections. So can present with the group three picture. So treat and underlying group three picture. Adding therapy in these two groups and generally is not recommended because the adverse outcome 
in uh, using BH target therapy in these two groups. Skeletal disease can be presented with the group four. How? By coronary artery obstruction, PEs, and and uh, uh, and small vessel diseases. So can present with picture similar to group four, and you have to treat accordingly. Uh, so a group five is, is a disease where there's no clear path of physiology and can fall in any one of these group, one, two, three, and four. And you have to identify which group it is belong to, but most likely, and treat accordingly, and based on the literature and treatment pathway mentioned in the literature. So let us let's, uh, start with PAH group one pulmonary hypertension. There's a lot of studies uh, has been mentioned and has been uh, 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 used as targeted therapy in pulmonary hypertension and has a, a clinical uh, a specific uh, criteria and endpoint has been reached in these studies and shows improvement in pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary artery hypertension patients. So uh, if you remember the first uh, slide by Dr. Hussam, the first uh, therapy has been uh, uh, published or used in 19, between 1990 to 1996, almost in 1994, which is apoprostenol. So we are just early in the, in, in the, in the, in the, in the disease. We have early, uh, the first therapy approved for to treat pulmonary artery hypertension is just in the uh, late 90s. And since that time, we are have a lot of medication, almost 11 medication has been used. Uh, uh, we are targeting three pathways so far in pulmonary hypertension. First pathway called prostacycline pathway, uh, which can cause vasodilatation and decrease the vasculopathy. The medication is abiprostanol, triprostanol, eriprost. Uh, this medication has been taken off from the, the, the market. And bag, which is a uh, uh, prostacycline uh, receptor uh, agonist. Uh, the other pathway is nitric oxide. There is two kind of treatment. Uh, the first one is sildenafil and tadalafil. Uh, which is phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and this lead to vasodilatation and decrease the vasculopathy or uh, soluble glucuronate cyclase with reusuguat, which use the same pathway. So both of them is nitric oxide pathway. The third pathway is endothelin receptors. So we have endothelin rece uh, receptor antagonists like bosentan, abiracentan, and macetentin. Both of them decrease the vis uh, vasoconstriction because the uh, the endothelium causing vasoconstriction. So using these medications to prevent vasoconstriction and uh, uh, decreasing the vasculopathy. This is the main pathway we are using uh, current days. Uh, so uh, the, the medication has been used, uh, endothelium receptor antagonist, bosentan, and bresentan, and macetentin, a nitric oxide pathway like sildenafil and tadalafil, or uh, a soluble guanylate cyclase, uh, like uh, and, and reuse cigarette, uh, bro, uh, prostacycline pathway, abiprostenol, triprostenol, iliprost, and slexabag. Uh, abiprostenol is IV therapy most of the time. Uh, triprostenol, either IV or, or sub Q. Also, there is some uh, can be used as inhaled. Iliprost, mainly inhaled, and uh, uh, slexabag is uh, oral uh, therapy. You see, all these are oral therapy except all these three prostacycline pathways. So, uh, uh, mentioned, I think, by Dr. Hussam regarding when we have a patient, we have a sign, symptoms, we diagnose them, we screen them, we reach a specific diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. At this point, you need to stratify your patient. You have to understand where is your patient's position at this uh, point of time. We have a lot of registries, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, a marker to indicate is your patient is low risk, high risk, intermediate risk of mortality. A lot of study either reveal Swedish registry, Combera, or French registry. They are using a specific risk factor to identify where is your patient exactly at this point of time. And all of them, they have their own literature and they have their own, own, own criteria and, and, and validity of, of uh, criteria. So whatever you are using, I'm using uh, ARS EAC guideline 2015 because it looks simple and, and, and easy to use. Uh, it is uh, contained of clinical signs and symptoms like signs of heart failure, progression of the symptoms, pro, uh, presence of the SNQB and functioning class. So based on these clinical signs, the, any time of the at time of diagnosis or follow up, you can use these things and identify your patient whether he's in the green with the low risk, risk or yellow with the intermediate risk and high uh, with the red. 
Uh, then uh, we have another important things that we used to identify your patient uh, uh, severity and risk, like using six minute walk tests, cardiopulmonary exercise tests, uh, BMB or pre pro BMB, imaging like echocardiogram or cardiac MRI, and hemodynamic by right heart cath. All these important to identify your patient. Sometimes you don't have all these things together, but you can use most of these to identify your patient position and severity and risk. Why we have to identify your patient? Because if you identify your patient, you can choose which treatment pathway. And when you have to understand your patient as a sick and try to treat them early or bump up the therapy uh, more and add more therapy to push them from the red or the yellow to the green area with low survive, uh, with low uh, risk of mortality. So uh, this, this is important slide and, and I would uh, everyone take this uh, like a snapshot or capture screen for this slide. Uh, this is mentioned 2019 article in World Symposium uh, of Pulmonary Hypertension in Nice. So we have a patient confirmed with pulmonary hypertension uh, centers and we have to use uh, uh, some uh, general measure as support therapy like if he need oxygen, we give oxygen, if he lasix or, or diuretics, because we we'll give lasix, uh, low salt, uh, low fluid intake and so on. So there's some supportive therapy. So then we have uh, to identify, do we have a vasoreactivity test and it is positive in the right heart cath. So we'll use calcium channel blocker, especially in patients with adiabatic heritable and drug and toxin. Uh, then if they are not, we have to, if the patient is non-vasoreactive, we have to identify our patient. Is he in red? Is he in uh, red and yellow or, or green? As, as me, I mentioned before, then the risk is certification. Based on this, we have to go further with using a therapy and choose your pathway. So if the patient has low or intermediate risk, we have to initiate a combination therapy at the beginning, upfront combination therapy to hit hard this kind of diseases and pulmonary arterial hypertension. If he is a high risk, we have again to have a combination therapy, including IV process cycles. So we can use here oral therapy, but here we have to use uh, uh, IV therapy if it is available at this time of point of treatment. There is some minority of patients, they have no clear guideline and they have no clear studies supporting combination therapy. So we have some residual of patient. There, there is some rule of monotherapy I have to mention later on. After initiation of this therapy at time of diagnosis, you have to see the patient in three to six months to identify their risk again. You have to go back again in three to six months and to re-stratify your patient. And based on this uh, stratification, you have to decide, is the patient uh, pushed back to the low risk? So can, keep and continue on your medications. If not, still he is intermediate or he's getting worse to intermediate or high risk, you have to uh, bump up or add up uh, uh, sequential therapy, meaning sequential, you know, adding more therapy after uh, uh, on top of a previous uh, therapy. And in three to six months, you have to decide about your patient and go back and forth and back based on the, uh, the risk. So the, uh, the, the risk of certification is always it's your, your friend in the clinic to decide whether the patient is doing bad or doing good and whether to add therapy or not to add therapy. Uh, and at the end, we have to think about the high risk or there is no improvement in tuberous therapy or maximum medical therapy to risk the patient transplant. So we have to identify your patient. You have to identify the risk, start therapy, close monitoring, re-certify them again and add or, or uh, send for another expert or lung like transplantation. So as I mentioned, re-certify your patient always in your clinic at time of diagnosis and at time of uh, uh, follow-up. So uh, there is a multiple best ways regarding what we have to do. There's a study uh, proven to use double therapy, combination therapy, I have to mention it now, and why we have to mention combination therapy at the beginning. And also there's a study suggesting the triple therapy. Another study is for some residual of patients who has no clear uh, guideline regarding using combination therapy in the literature, so we have to use monotherapy. There is another study supporting that switching therapy, switching one of the uh, therapy to another one from the same pathway or another pathway, that in order to improve the patient condition. And there is sequential therapy when you are starting one therapy, adding another therapy in like in a time. Advanced therapy and transplant is the end, this is the end choice of, of this kind of diseases. Uh, in ARS 2015, they mentioned all the therapy. This is a monotherapy that has, that has been approved to treat the patient. And you can see the, the class and the level of evidence in these use. So class one, uh, level A and B, 
and based on the WHO function class, like NEHA function class and which type of, of treatment and which type of, of group of, tip, of patient. Uh, also, uh, it's uh, again approved in this uh, 2015 guideline regarding the using of combination therapy, upfront initial drug with combination therapy, and there is a number of medication has been used and approved to treat the patient and improve their underlying condition and endpoint result in pulmonary arterial hypertension. And also there is some study suggesting that adding therapy after the, the baseline therapy uh, uh, to, to treat or improve the patient underlying condition. And all these studies has been used and published and you can go ahead and read it one by one according to your uh, preference. Uh, the, the, the studies in the beginning before 2013 using the six minute walk test as, 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 as the primary endpoint to treat the patient. So there is increasing the six minute walk test. So this is a positive science and proof the therapy as we mentioned here from Bosentan to Tripristanel uh, uh, and you can see that you, the, the number of patients is low in these studies. Then in 2013, there is through three important study. It is like a game changing in pulmonary hypertension when they use initial combination therapy as 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 a primary uh, uh, use a uh, combination therapy at, at the beginning of, of the treatment, and they have. Uh, used uh, the, the, the endpoint different from the six-minute walk test. So, so six-minute walk test in the, in the bath is no longer used. You use the end, uh, event related uh, 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 target, meaning if the patient has deterioration or clinical worsening, hospitalization, or using adding therapy, this is the point where there is a, a negative marker. So this study has been used and looking into this target instead of six-minute walk test, uh, and this is like a changing of how we are looking to the patient in pulmonary hypertension, not a six minute growth test as a, as, a, as a primary end point. i uh, just go ahead with some uh, important study in the pulmonary hypertension ambition using ambercentin and, and, mass, uh, and, and tadalafil as upfront combination therapy and reduction of clinical failure, as I mentioned before in this study, uh, as ambition study, the, the, the end point was a clinical failure and deterioration in patient condition, there is the reduction by 50% compared to the monotherapy. Uh, uh, Servin, where they use, uh, 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 sorry, this is not sexy bag, it's macetintin, uh, as effective significantly reduce the disease progression and hospitalization. Uh, Optima using macetintin and tadalafil, and again, significant improvement in hemodynamic and functional capacity compared to the monotherapy. Graven, uh, uh, looking for sexy bag, uh, there is 40% reduction, hazard ratio of 0 0.6 uh, uh, compared to the placebo. And there is also in the Greven, they are using the abfront and also used as sequential therapy. Uh, another idea and another way of treating patients is uh, replacing one treatment with another, like here, replacing phosphodiesterase inhibitors, five like sedalafil or, or or, or uh, sildenafil with, with reusuguat. And this is shows improvement more than 30 meters compared to the other group when we keep them in the, the, the baseline therapy and uh, compared to the reusuguat when you are replacing this medication an increase by 30 meters and improvement in six minute walk test, functional capacity reduction by 30% and improvement in the primary endpoint with PMP. A Triton study using upfront triple therapy and still we are waiting to publish this, this study. However, there is no significant differences in the treatment regimen uh, uh, and anal analysis is a signal to improve long-term outcome and initial triple therapy versus double therapy. And we are waiting this study. So we have different way of treating patient and what we have to do. And this medication use is, is based on the study and literature. Some word about the monotherapy, when we have to use a monotherapy, phaser reactivity responder, uh, as a patient who has historically stable and long term, like in the past, he's already in one monotherapy and keep the same, and he's in low risk group for quite long time. Not for now, let's say for for quite long time, based on the previous uh, uh, literature. A patient with PPOD, HIV, portal pulmonary, uncorrected congenital heart disease, you need to start monotherapy and bulb up according to the patient condition. Very mild disease according to the BH center. Uh, sometimes there is underlying diseases or, co or comorbidities like left heart disease with component of group one. Sometimes you don't need to go ahead with combination therapy. And this has been uh, reviewed and, uh, and mentioned clearly in 2019 guideline in the World Symposium Pulmonary Hypertension. So what we have in our King Fahad Medical City, uh, we have a, 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 
uh, three clinic adult pulmonary hypertension and one pediatric pulmonary hypertension. We have all these medications. We have a bosentin, macetentin, we have a nitric oxide pathway, we have a sildenafil, and we have a uh, versus cyclin pathway, we have ibuprostenol as ICU. We are trying to establish a, a a team uh, uh, to use outpatient avoprostenol. Not yet, we are reached this point. It need multi team and multi, uh, logistics to use. However, we have it as ICU for so, so far. We have Eluprost. We have Selexibag as well, just recently approved. So we have all these kind of medication. We are a, a center of excellence in pulmonary hypertension uh, 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 management and diagnosis. Um, I think we, I don't have much time to talk about the prostacycline pathways. A prostacycline could be inhaled, uh, could be uh, IV, uh, continuous uh, pump therapy, or subcutaneous therapy, and have specific side effects, as I mentioned before. I don't think I have time to, to mention, but it's, it's need to be clear, comprehensive uh, uh, evaluation before deciding to go ahead. Bulmy hypertension is a comprehensive uh, management, including treatment, psychological, spiritual, rehabilitation, and so on. Uh, uh, if you have any one of you a uh, question or referrals, we are more than happy to help you. We receive all the consulting King Fahad Medical City from all the kingdom hospitals. Uh, we have a pulmonary hypertension clinic program just uh, recently approved uh, uh, under umbrella of, of C2 King Fahad Medical City and King, uh, Prince Mohammed bin Al-Aziz and other affiliated uh, hospitals. Uh, we have three PH clinic. Uh, uh, two of them under pulmonary uh, department and one under cardiology. So we have a, a, like a multidisciplinary approach in, in terms of pulmonary hypertension. We have a five consultants in, interested in pulmonary hypertension. Three of them is pulmonologists. Two of them is uh, a ICU consultant like Dr. Hassan. He's ICU of pulmonary and sleep medicine and pulmonary hypertension. Uh, uh, one uh, a cardiologist, interventionist, and a uh, pH specialist, and one pediatric uh, and congenital heart disease specialist. So we have different views, different approach of pulmonary hypertension in our institute. All pathway, as I mentioned before, we have all these medications and pathway in our institute, right heart cath, and all the core, uh, the, 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 the core important work of available in our center. Uh, if you have a patient you would like to have our opinion, you are more than welcome. Send it through a Halati sim, uh, system. I think most of you, you know it. Uh, if you have some um, confusion about this, you just ask the patient or our patient family to, to, to go to, through, to, to the eligibility department in King Fahad Medical City. Uh, give them just a summarized uh, uh, report indicating there is underlying pulmonary hypertension or so that, as we mentioned in, the, in our uh, literature, uh, uh, lectures and uh, having na uh, national ID and just ask them to go to eligibility and uh, the file will be open soon. Uh, it will be sent to me, Dr. Abdullah Khadir, Dr. Hassan Sakija, uh, one of us, and we will uh, divert this uh, to, to specific uh, PH clinic. Uh, if you have any confusion, just call us or email us. I'll just uh, put our emails uh, after this slide. Uh, we will see the patient in like in two weeks, uh, max. Uh, we are happy and we are uh, more than welcome to, to, to support you, to help you if you have any confusion, if you have any, 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 uh, any uh, uh, question regarding pulmonary hypertension, more than welcome. Uh, actually, we need to help our patients. They are a group of patients who has high risk. They have high mortality, high morbidity. Unfortunately, we need more awareness. We have to see patients earlier. Uh, um, and, and we have all the facility to do that uh, with, with your support. Uh, this is Dr. Hussam Sakija email. This is my email and this is like my Gmail. If you have like a big file, you need to ask about specific images or something like that. More than welcome to send this uh, your, your concern. You can take a snapshot or whatever. Uh, I'll just write it down and, and, and more than uh, welcome to, to, to help and support if you have any, any, any questions. Um, um, this is my talk. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Hassam, if you have something else to add. I think we have Dr. a little Shaya, uh, Thank you so much uh, for this. Uh, um, I'm not sure if we have time on it. No, I think, I think uh, we, we are doing very good on the time. We covered most of the material that we wanted to cover. And as I promised, we will not exceed our uh, allocated time. We appreciate your time. And uh, we, we understand how busy we are all and we need to attend to our other life uh, uh, stuff. But we, we had some case studies for you, but I mentioned some in my talk, and I think uh, you know the, the picture is being clear instead of taking an additional 30 minutes or so uh, to discuss them. 
uh, there were a lot of questions that were answered uh, on the spot on one to one and a lot of them has been already addressed uh, last question was about any uh, referral criteria uh, for me if you have a patient who you think we need to see just refer them even if you're not sure and we are going to be very happy to assist them and I believe our subspecialty experience will help to quickly identify the patients. And I can tell you, I see patients who don't have pH in my clinic, and I'm, I'm very fine with that. Uh, it's a very shortcut rather than going through an extensive workup and uh, ending up with the same uh, back, you know, final result. So if you feel your patient needs to be seen and you think we can offer them something, please go ahead and send to us. And we're available by email, by phones even. Uh, you can just discuss with us on the phone. There was a special case about uh, cesarean section followed by pulmonary hypertension. I'll be extremely happy to discuss with the, the, the person who asked. Uh, just call me or email me and we'll be happy to discuss these cases. Uh, we are accepting referral from everywhere. Our center is uh, you know, providing the service for the patients. We worked hard on making all these uh, resources available. It's not for us only, it's for our uh, patients. Uh, we have uh, trained people already in, in, uh, this, in the city that are actually very highly specialized in the field and they can offer uh, the best they can. Uh, uh, lastly, now we are here for you and uh, even at the general level, I'm probably a significant number of you are general practitioners or uh, some uh, not subspecialist in the field of cardiology or pulmonary, but we are here to support the general knowledge dissemination of knowledge in general. And at the end of the day, this will uh, rise our, uh, uh, I would say, standards in medicine in general in the kingdom, which is something that is much needed. The CME hours are important. Our interaction is important. And networking, knowing knowing us at least, uh, we are available for any, or any of you who needs any uh, professional help. We are here for you. Uh, you know, I think this was very successful. We had more than 1,000 attendees uh, with us in the meeting, and uh, we hope that some of the messages has been clearly reiterated and has been passed to everyone. We thank the organizers for the great uh, communication and uh, the, you know, the brochures, and thanks for the sponsor for sponsoring this activity. And as you noticed, we are, uh, even the sponsors are interested in the, uh, the core scientific value of these meetings rather than the marketing. We're not here to sell medications. We're here to identify patients and treat them properly. And hopefully that we will be participating in, in a piece with, with the well-being of our uh, uh, patients and population. Uh, I will close the meeting at this level. We are a couple of minutes uh, uh, early. Most of the messages lately is coming as a thank you. We really appreciate your being with us. And we are the ones who are thanking you for giving us the opportunity to outreach to you and be with you tonight. And we really appreciate the time that you spent with us. Hopefully it was very well spent and benefit has been uh, generalized for all. Uh, Shaya, do you want to say anything in the last uh, minute? Yeah, uh, thank you for, for everybody who is involved to to uh, to, to uh, organize this uh, sessions. Uh, I'm thanking all the attendees for for paying attention and and asking questions and being uh, interested and in, in, in helping patients. Uh, as I mentioned before, as mentioned by Dr. Hassan, don't be scared if you have a patient with pulmonary hypertension, whatever underlying diseases or causes, just refer. It's okay. We are fine. Don't be worried if you think, oh, King Bad Medical City or whatever underlying nearest pulmonary hypertension uh, uh, clinic. Just go ahead and, 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 and refer or just ask. Uh, we have all the facility in the kingdom. We have all the specialists in the kingdom looking for this kind of disease. There is a lot of things we can do for our patient. So if you are seeing patient early, send to them early, please. They don't wait. You, you can see now that the guidelines, the workup, uh, I know I can understand that the old workup you can do it, but you can send the patient and, and we are more than happy to help us. Uh, thank you again for all. I have nothing to add. Thank you so much. Thank you.